Welcome to the Hustle or Bust podcast powered by Paver Art. Our mission is simple, to dive deep into the world of entrepreneurship, small business, and all the success, struggle, and challenges that need to be confronted in the pursuit of growth. We celebrate the entrepreneurial spirit, but perhaps most important, we want you to learn at least one idea that you can put into action immediately to make your investment in time worthwhile. For a couple of guys running a small growth business, putting out a podcast can be challenging. Nevertheless, we look up and we see a mini milestone, episode number 50. We revisit maybe one of the most important concepts we've covered as it relates to building a business, the 10,000 hour rule. What is the 10,000 hour rule? Well, popularized by Malcolm Gladwell, it's about developing true expertise in any skill that is a matter of disciplined, defined practice. 10,000 hours to be exact. To do this, people need to define their careers as a craft, a journey, something you will aim to master over the long haul. For over 12 years, I've written a blog and now a podcast called Hustle or Bust. You know what? I can make a pretty good case that the secret is not hustle or bust, it's 10,000 hours or bust. And that's the title of episode number 50. We hope you enjoy and drop us a line with some feedback. The 10,000 hour rule basically is defined as the amount of time it would normally take on average to do the same thing or to learn something in a particular field and just work at it for 10,000 hours. The, the example we brought up in one of the first podcasts we ever did was the Beatles. Great example. Um, you know, their, uh, their travels to Germany, the 10,000 hours that they spent learning to be a band. Before they were the Beatles. Like before, well... They yes, they they became the Beatles during that that process. But regardless of what they you know called themselves at the time, um, uh, the, the the repetitive nature, the uh, you know the constant curiosity in regards to learning more and more about the music that they were playing and how to how to play their instruments, how to perform in front of a crowd. Uh, how to get along for endless hours, endless days, endless years playing together as a band. They compiled 10,000 hours in five or six years of doing this and emerged as probably one of the greatest pop rock bands of all time. Yeah. Maybe, and, and two of the greatest singer song, two of the greatest, well, we'll call them singer songwriters, but they just call them songwriters, two of the greatest songwriters of all time. There's, and, and nobody would dispute that. So, and then the, the other example I think he used, so the, the Beatles made it very clear, but the other one was Gates. So Bill Gates, yeah. back in the, when the computer age was coming about, I guess this was mid-70s, mm-hmm. he had lab time from the local, I think it was University of Washington. Uh, was it Washington or Michigan? Uh, Michigan was some other person, but he was in the, the Pac Northwest. Correct. Yeah. He had access to the lab at crazy hours from like right. 12 to 5 a.m. Mm-hmm. And what did Gates do? He used it from 12 to 5 a.m. Because nobody else wanted those. Yeah, hours. nobody wanted those hours. So he's right. like, all right, free compute time? Sure, I'll, I'll go in there. And he was exactly. in there for, I think it was four or five years. Mm-hmm. He was doing nothing but sitting in the lab over the course of the night. What other teenagers doing that at that time? Not many. Uh, yes. <laughs> we, we get back to the eight percent versus ninety-two percent. Right. That's he was in the eight. He was probably in the one percent at the time. Right. Now the other thing that Gladwell does is you know he defines the ten. That's not existing for ten thousand hours. Right. It's practicing, define practicing, getting better at your craft. So not just working at a certain field for ten thousand hours, but practicing to learn the craft and get better at it. And you're but and you're you're practicing, but you're also at the same time. I think you're expanding your knowledge base in that particular field. You're learning more and more and more. Uh, committing it to memory, you know, the, the, the muscle memory of, you know, repetition. Um, it doesn't matter what you're playing, what you're doing, whether it's the sciences, whether you're writing for a newspaper, whatever. Commit 10,000 hours to something, there's pretty damn good, pretty damn good chance that you're going to get good at it. Now, he also points out that there are points along the way in the Gates story and points along the way in the Beatles story where uh, happenstance occurs and certain things almost by luck, right. you know, out of, uh, uh, you know, uh, occur out of nowhere to, to push 
what they're doing along and move them into an area or into a, into a, a broader area where all of a sudden they get known, they get seen, uh, and then eventually what becomes the Beatles becomes the Beatles, what eventually becomes Gates and computers becomes Gates and computers. Uh, but, you know, it's not just the practice. I mean, we talked about this. Uh, and this will probably be the last uh, retrospective I talk about here, but, you know, it was, you know, I can play a musical instrument, okay? My cousin can play a musical instrument. He has the gift. We talked about that. He has the gift. Mm -hmm. So his 10,000 hours are going to be uh, significantly more uh, involved and are, there's going to be a better outcome with his 10,000 hours than mine. Mm -hmm. But my 10,000 hours got me a lot of, uh, it, you know, it, it gave me an appreciation of music that I heretofore never would have had had I not committed all that time to doing this from the age of 9 to 16 uh, with that particular instrument that I chose. And we will not bring that up, as a matter of fact, that particular instrument that I chose. But his time with the, uh, you know, married with that gift that he has, that internal, that I don't know that 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 mental gift that he has, that made him a much much better musician, if you will, than me, than I ever could be. And you know, but to this day, I'm jealous to death of him for that. But it's it, there's all these things that it's not just and it, people, other people who criticize Gladwell says, you know, it's not just ten thousand hours, and they're right. But Gladwell mentions that too. Mm -hmm. So all these things. But you need place. to have a proclivity, whatever it is that you're going to put the ten thousand exactly. hours in. You got to have some God-given talent. And this is important when you look at the ten thousand hour. This part of the ten thousand hour rule is important when you look at certain people who become entrepreneurs, who become business owners. Because, quite frankly, yes, there needs to be something that occurs that 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 snaps them into a new dimension. It snaps them to the next level. Uh, that that makes what all that time they spent learning their craft, you know, becomes broader and becomes more expanded. It becomes more and more important. Um, well, you brought up a key word there. I'm interested in that word when you say the word craft. Do people today, and a little bit of a loaded question, but let's let's go into it. The word craft or trade, and that could be accounting, it could be marketing, it could be operations, it could be making things, it could be selling. Sure. It could be any types of functions. Building homes. Building homes, uh, paving driveways, uh, making pizza at the local pizzeria. Do people look that, that are going to go into the workforce, whether they've got college or not, do they view it as a craft, a convocation, a journey, a trade? Do they view it as that that's something that you just can't work, exchange time for money, but get better at it with 10,000 hours? So talk a little bit about craft. Probably not. I would think, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll look to myself for this. I, I, can, I think I can only answer the question based on my experiences and my background. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got out of college, I, um, you know, I, I, got into, I got into a business that was started from the ground up, okay, and I was part of that business. I was part of the three guys that started that business, but it wasn't because it was my idea. It was somebody else's idea, all right? Uh, two other gentlemen who were partners, and one of the guys came to me and said, hey, we'd like you to be part of this. We'd like you to, you know, we'd like you to sell this product. We'd like you to get out there and sell this product. Okay, well, with the exception of the, uh, uh, the startup cash, there was no, you know, we had to make our money and whatever profit we made is what was what we were going to pay ourselves on, okay? And um, um, this, you know, it, it, it just evolved from that. I got lucky enough to be around, and this is one of the key points that that's worked so well in my life. I've always been surrounded by people who are smarter than me, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm, try, I'm not trying to be humble here. It's the truth. I've always been surrounded by people that are smarter than me. And the, you know, not only have I learned from them, but 
as I evolved in my 10,000 hours and as I became better and better at what I did, learning from these people all along, mentors, teachers, um, uh, you know, uh, I developed my own I developed my own thing, my own personality, my own little fiefdom, if you will. And that came from a background in operations um, and accounting and what eventually became sales. And I realized that I got to be pretty good at sales. But none of that comes about if all these other things didn't intervene in the meantime. I never would have gotten involved with Paver Art had I never gotten involved with this company called Kiorino. I never would have gotten involved with Kiorino how I never, had I never gotten involved with the company J.E. Rhodes & Sons. Conveyor belting, for God's sakes. Power transmission belting. You can't get more boring than that, okay? And then you, you know, but that's the, those were the steps along the way. That's where my 10,000 hours came from. And all along the way, I'm working and dealing with people that I'm learning from, okay? You, you can't downplay that. We got into this business. I think I've mentioned this before. I didn't know a concrete paver from a banana, okay? I, I just I had no idea what a concrete paver was. Now we've been selling, you know, you know, manufacturing product using concrete pavers for the last 21 years. And if you count the year and a half that uh, we took before we started the business to really dig deep, that's when I started my learning process with that. And again, surrounded myself. I didn't surround myself. It just it happened that way. Um, Ken Bull and, and, um, uh, and Mick Soroka. Two guys who were brilliant at what they do. I mean, absolutely brilliant at what they do. But neither one of them can sell their way out of a paper bag, okay? Or um, organize uh, and handle, uh, you know, an operations type situation. Everything else, they were excellent at, okay? The three of us coming together, I mean, that was the culmination for me. That, that's when all of a sudden, I found myself with two partners that not only could I trust and not only could I continue to learn from, but I could contribute to with all those years of learning from my other mentors and teachers. Um, yeah, but was I consciously thinking, but one of these days I'm going to own a bit? No, no. It fell into that. And I, uh, to wrap this up, at least on my end, it's, it's been the greatest experience of my life. I, I you know, I am extremely fortunate to be where I am today. So, uh, but that's that's where it came. That's how it evolved for me. Well, let, let me the craft, if you will, the craft evolved from all of that. Of Here, that. Here's how I would to to try and merge Gladwell's ten thousand hours of practice, not just working, uh, with a career. Let's say you're nineteen years old, eighteen years old. You're in high school, going to college. Or you're not going to college, you're going to pursue an independent, non-degree. You're not going to go down to, I'm going to go purchase a degree. I'm going to go build my own learning path and career, right? Exactly. So what does 10,000 hours mean? Let's say you're working in your first job at a high school, at a college. Here, in my view, is how the 10,000 hours, the rubber meets the road, if you will. Are you willing to work for free over and above your 40 hours? Said differently, if you're going to get paid for 40 hours if it's a full-time job, are you willing to devote a Saturday to practicing your craft without getting paid for it? Mm -hmm. So, I'll give you an example. My first corporate job, it was a co-op job at Kraft Foods. I was 19 years old. I was into sales information technology. I was there for six months full time. And I worked weekends. And it was a salary job. So, And I was happy to do it. I was happy to go learn my computer skills, data analytics, all this other stuff. And I was there to work and build experience. So why wouldn't I? But if I fast forward through every stage of my career, guess what? If the start time normally was 8 o'clock, I was there at 6 a.m., not because I wanted to get a jump on my work. Some of that 6 to 8 time was getting better at my craft. Gotcha. It was studying the next marketing principle. It was studying what financial management was. It was studying leadership. It, there was a time. Now, did that help my job? Absolutely, it did. But it wasn't getting paid for it, right? Even if you're salary, there's kind of an expectation you're going to work 40 hours, and as you go up, the hours tend to get a little bit longer. Maybe they go to 50, maybe they go to 60. Yep. But there's a major part of the corporation of the workforce that if the defined work hours are 8 to 4, 9 to 5, 9 to 6, they might stretch a little bit, but they're not going to go crazy and say, I'm going to go get 10,000 or 15 hours a week extra 
to getting better at my craft. But I think, I could be wrong, if you're not willing to do that, you're not going to get into business ownership or you're not going to get into senior leadership, advanced career planning if you're not going to invest in yourself to get better at your craft. Mm -hmm. So as I look at my, I'll use eight years in when I was CMO at Monogram Foods, it was 15 hours a week of defined practice. It was getting there early, working a half a day on a weekend. Was some of that related to the job? Yeah, it was. But a lot of that was getting better at the function that I was leading, learning different things. And this is at the dawn of digital marketing. Nobody was going to send me to a six-month program to go <laughs> learn digital marketing. It was, if I choose to learn it, I'm going to put the freaking time in to learn it. And nobody asked me to learn it, by the way. That was just, I got to learn this stuff if I want to keep up and not become a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. So, but I think that 10,000, you know, if you think about, it's amazing how lonely the world is at 5 a.m. It's dark. Nobody's up. Don't we know it? Right? What a quiet time. And it's amazing how many people don't want to get their ass up out of bed at 5 a.m. And get better at their craft. Exactly. A lot more comfortable sleeping, isn't it? Yeah, it's a lot more comfortable. So why don't people do it? It's fucking hard. It's it's more comfortable not. So and by the way, I'm not. This is not advice for anybody because this is polarized. And I can hear people thinking, "Oh, he's got no work life balance. Oh, he's got this." If you love it, the Beatles, I think, love doing their thing on clubs every single night of the week. Whenever getting together, they might not been making money, but they loved hanging out, playing, and refining their craft. Yeah. It's, and on its face, it was a horrible life. Okay, you're sleeping in rooms that not glamorous can barely hold four people mm -hmm. with four people. Mm -hmm. But now you're touching on the work ethic part of this. I don't know if you can learn work ethic. You can be exampled into it. I, I think you're right on that. I don't, but I don't think you can learn work ethic, and it, and it has to be something that comes from within. Well, uh, let me build on that point because I agree with yeah, you. Yeah, the 15 hours that you're talking about, you could have just as easily been out there, you know, on a softball team playing softball on the weekends or hardball, whatever. It's your baseball guy. Look, these are choices. When I was in high school, I had the the joy of managing a liquor store. What a great yeah. job in high school, right? Exactly. Well, what do you think my friends were doing as a junior and senior in high school I in New exactly Jersey? What they They're going doing. to the Jersey Shore. Right exactly that sounds like a good old yeah. time, doesn't it? And I'm running a freaking liquor store 50 hours a week. And there's an argument to be made for the 92% of the people in this country that that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. That's what you, hey, listen, you only go around once. That's right. Yeah, but you know what? We only go around once too, all right? And we chose to do something else. And that's, that makes us no better or worse than anybody else. But that's what we wanted to do. Um, and, but anyway, I, I interrupted you. Go ahead. Well, I think the point is, number one, it is a choice. The, you know, and obviously hustle or bust. It's a verb, right? Hustle. Right. So I do think the 10,000 hour, I think work ethic, it can be learned if you're modeled it early, like you said. Mm -hmm. And parents are the ones with their kids. The choice of going to the shore or working in the summer, right. that's a big, that'll, that'll instill work ethic pretty quick, won't it? Mm -hmm. yep. if, if you obsess over the kid having AP classes, because that'll set them up better for college versus getting a part-time job, that will dictate work ethic. Now, it doesn't mean you're not working in the AP classes, but these are different choices. These are conscious choices that establish it. It's a lot easier to establish work ethic at 16 years old than it is at 24, don't you think? Oh, for sure. I mean, the longer you put off the 10,000-hour method of getting better at your craft, the harder it becomes. The sooner you learn. You don't wake up at 30 yeah. years old and say, I'm going to start practicing and investing in myself to get better at marketing, to get better at financial management, to get better at whatever it is, restaurant management. You don't wake up at a certain age yeah. and just say, yeah, I think I should start this. Don't happen. No. So we, and we actually spent a podcast talking about this where we essentially told parents, please. Advocate for work. Don't let your kids start early. waste their summers mm -hmm. because... They're wasting their summers. And and the, even if you have to make them do it. And look, we've talked about at college, college yeah. Everyone's sick of me talking about college, but college is adult daycare when you look at it now. And, and I see it. Everybody's in. They're going away for four years, they're drinking, they're in their fraternities and sororities. It's adult daycare. They are not developing work ethic there. And you know, so that's so okay, so they didn't have it. We know the teenagers aren't getting it. They're not getting jobs in high school. They're not working. Then they go to adult daycare for four years or five years or six years. And so they are kicking the can down the road on developing life's number one skill, which is the ability to show up consistently over time, that exchange, work ethic. Yeah, exactly. And that's the, uh, so by the, by the time they're 22 years old. Bad heads. If that's when they're starting to learn, that goes back to what you just said. You can't, 
This isn't something that you're going to learn when you're 35 or 45. By that time, you're pretty much set in your ways. But, but I think a crystal clear thing, if, if for people to ask themselves a question, whether they're 17 years old or 37 years old, am I willing to go in on a weekend and learn my craft mm -hmm. and I'm not getting paid for it? Am I willing to make that trade off? Number one, do you love it enough to do that? Do you see the benefits in it? And if you don't, no big deal. But there are there are other people that will put that sacrifice in, and that's who you're competing with. There's going to be you just got to know there, your your upside is limited if you don't exactly. And there, okay, now you said something very interesting there. You have to love it enough to do it. Well, you know what? You may not be totally in love with whatever it is specifically that you know. You may like it a whole lot, but in my mind, you have to love the work. You got to be excellent at it. You got to be on a path to get good, very good at what you do. And you, have to, you, you have to, you have to be able to shrug off. In fact, I, I can't believe this. I saw this this morning. One of our esteemed senator senators is coming up with the idea, uh, and whose name I won't mention, but it's coming up with the idea that you know he's going to push the thirty-two hour week for the same amount of money that you're making now. Hmm. You know. Oh my God. Nice. Yeah, that's right. That is so anti -work. Innovation in government, just that's what we need. <laughs> what a, yeah, that's what an oxymoron. And finding more ways to spend other people's money. It's, uh, anyway, I, I don't want, let's not go down that. If I, because you know me, I get down this road and I can't get off of it. Anyway, to make a long story short, it's, it's, the whole idea of work ethic is something that is crucial. It's a cornerstone to making any business owner or entrepreneurial uh, project uh, work. You've got to be able to put in the time, hours, that you're not getting paid for. There's a, there's a payoff at the end, yeah, we can talk about that and all that. But you, you've got to love the work. And you've got to love working. You've got, you've got to be comfortable. You have to be very, very comfortable in that sphere, in that realm. Um, you, you know, know it, it never, never bothered, bothered it, I'm, I'm sure it didn't bother you, but it never bothered me that, uh, you know, uh, my roommates in college were, you know, going down to the beach for the weekends in the summer, they're, you know, living at home with their parents, you know, mom's cooking breakfast and lunch and dinner and making your bed and doing your clothes. That's, look, uh, I, uh, you know, um, you know my, my parents did some of that, they provided that for me, but I always worked. I worked every summer, every vacation. So did you. It's you've got to love to do the work. Well, I think look, the other thing about Gladwell's rule of ten thousand hours. It's a lot of hours. So let's just say when I was at Monogram running the marketing team, and let's just say I was putting in fifteen hours of practice a week. You know, let's just call that the five thirty a.m. to seven thirty ish. Sure. Maybe half a day on the weekend. Well, if that was when I started practice. And you start adding up 12 and a half hours a week, that's the equivalent of 15 years. That's a long time if that's all you can practice, right? So, and this is why I think, and by the way, that's real. So, I was not capable of running my own business and buying my own business at 30 years old. I mean, in my heart of hearts, I believe that. 35, I think I was getting pretty damn close. 40, I was definitely there. I was, you know, I probably waited a little bit too long. Where was the tipping point for you in regards to when you started thinking that, you know what? I can do this myself. I can, I, I you know, well, I, I, I'd like to, I didn't I'd get like that to venture into the realm of, of starting my own business or buying a business. And what, where, well, what was the tipping point there for you? I, I bought the food manufacturing business when I was 40 years old. Um, and I got an inkling of it when I was approached, when I was just about to turn 40. It was quick. It was like 90 days, 100 days or so. But to be honest with you, I didn't know that I was ready until maybe 30 to 60 days after I owned a business. You're kidding. Yeah. So was I confident? Obviously, I was confident. I guarantee $12 million of debt, well north of what Kim and I were worth. So I would have gone bankrupt 10 times over. Well, that tells work. me that you Well, that tells me that so you I was were confident. In, yeah, but that tells but me you, know. were, that you were in situations and circumstances prior to that. Yeah, absolutely. Where you were tested. Yep, okay? absolutely. And you were successful in making that test work, whatever that test right. was. I was so confident. Whatever level of marketing, whatever company you were working for. And that repeat did that repeat itself enough to the point where you said to yourself, you know what, I, I know I can do this. Yeah, it's a snowball effect. So life, success, failure, they tend to build on each other. They tend to compound. So 
between the ages I started Monogram when I was at 30 years or 32 years old, 31, something like that. Ran there for eight and a half years and started to develop skills, confidence, relationships, connections, all of that. So obviously I was confident enough to guarantee a level of debt well, well north of my net worth. I was confident enough, but did I know I could do it? No, you don't only know with clarity until you're kind of in that seat. But once I was in the seat, I knew at 30 days, 60 days, driving past Broadway University, Broadway Prison, I just felt confident. And, and by the way, the moment I had full control of the company, I had less stress, even though I had that debt, than when I was working for somebody as part of an executive team. So I had control. I mean, that's an interesting point. I was fully accountable. When you actually were in a more financial after risk after you bought the business. Yeah, more financial risk to my family than ever in my lifetime, probably will ever have in my lifetime, and I had less stress. Because I was in control. I was going to screw it up on my own or succeed on my own. That didn't mean I didn't have a team. I had a team. I had investors. I had the whole thing. Sure. But depending on how you're wired, you know, I am. If I'm in control, that's when I'm in my element. And that doesn't mean I'm going to be successful, by the way. But it does mean, for me, stress and not being in control are like, they're inversely correlated. You bring up a great point. It's, we, can, we can call it the everybody looks to you corollary. Mm -hmm. Okay. You wake up every morning, and this is exactly, I went through this, going through this for the last 30 years. You wake up in the morning, start your day, and you realize you're the guy. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, that's not blowing, you know, I'm not blowing my horn, your horn, anybody's horn. You wake up and you go, geez, I'm the one, everything ends right here, okay? I'm the one, yeah, I have a team. I've got people that are very skilled people that I'm working with who I like to work with, who I respect, uh, and they're terrific. But at the end of the day, I'm the one calling the shots, right. okay? And I'm the one, the next guy up is going to look at, uh, and when you own your own business, the, the next guy up is your wife, mm -hmm. okay? Your kids. You're the one that's in charge. And that's a, that's a strange feeling. It's a scary feeling. That's, but... The good entrepreneurs, the guys who, who start successful businesses, that, you know, do they think about that? Probably. I know I did. But once you dig in, you know, once you get two minutes into your day, that shit goes away. Well, I think the, the opportunity now, you know, and that, that, um, this is related basically to what you were saying about the stress. I think the stress going down, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that you're willing to accept that mantle of responsibility. I mean, that's... That's huge. That is really huge. Not everybody can do that. I mean, we see people in our, you know, every day in this business. We talk to people. We talk to, uh, you know, our customers, client. You, you speak to these people on the phone, and you're, you know, it's how do you, how do they get up in the morning? Not well, not. here's what I'm gonna tell you, because I was on the path to the ten thousand hours of practice, probably from twenty four years old up to forty when I bought the first business. Right. And let's just say half of that time was when I was in Memphis. Half of that practice was there. There is no way I would have bought that business, wouldn't have been in a position to, had I not been doing that routine of investing in myself and practicing at my craft. Exactly. That's just Great common point. sense. But there's there, no way. Great point. Well, well, people Now, by the way, in this day and age, you can take Economics 101 from Wharton for free and get a certificate for it if you want to pay 100 bucks if it makes you feel better, right? You can take finance from Harvard. You can take... Any class you want for free if you're willing to invest the time in it. Sure. You can take digital marketing. You can get a Google certificate in digital marketing, SEO, you name it. So now the opportunities to get better at your craft and educate yourself for free, with the exception of your time, are endless. They really are. Free, free education did not exist in 2006 to 2014. Right. To the degree it does now. Now, YouTube was there and exploding and all that, but... The opportunities for people to get better at their craft. Every small business in America needs help with digital marketing. Every small business in America probably needs some help with financial management. But they're resource constrained. So the, the person that wants to work in a small business and invest in their time to get, and they view it as a craft, that maybe one day they want to lead the small business or be a general manager, or maybe they want to actually own it on their self. Nothing's stopping them. Are they willing, number one, are they good enough? Number two, are they willing to put the time in to get better at it when they're not getting paid for it? So those are the tough questions they have to ask. Are they willing to work from 6 a.m. to noon every Saturday from here to the next five years to compile money and get better at their craft to put themselves on the path? 
Well, that's a, that's a now some people are just naturally gifted. They can just get there. This is why I think, you know, I, I, I'm amazed that these MBAs graduating at the age of 27 that think they can go borrow five million dollars and start a business, and a lot of them are successful. But I just think I'm a believer in this 10,000 hour concept. And there's no way at 27 years old, I'm sounding like a boomer, right? Uh, that they could have compiled that level of expertise to go take on that level of risk. Um, to kind of do that. I think you got to actually have the expertise and the shops and the investment in yourself. A lot of people are proving me wrong, so I'm not, I don't have a, a monopoly on the truth on this topic. Well, it's the, you know, if it's the, it's the helicopter rule. You know, if you're up here, if you're above the fray, okay, there's people that can run a business that way, but, and I guess be successful and never get down into the nuts and bolts of the business, never actually understand the operations and mm -hmm. that, never actually understanding the human resource end of it. Um, that's not how you dealt with L&M when you got the business. You, you got into the nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. When we started this business, we got into the nuts and bolts. I mean, the dirty part of this, I mean, you, can, you have to, it's like my father said, the greatest piece of advice I ever had in my life, you've got to keep your nose in the money mm -hmm. every day. Right. You can't take your eyes off of that ever. And, you, you know, it's one thing to be able to run a balance sheet and a trial balance and, you know, you know understand the general ledger. And Here's why getting better at your craft matters. In the world of private equity, and there's a lot of private equity dollars chasing now, now all of a sudden blue-collar business is sexy mm -hmm. on Wall Street. They're investing money in HVAC companies and electrical and plumbing business. All of a sudden now, blue-collar businesses are trading at levels that we've never seen before. And they're, they're selling for like eight times cash flow yeah. that have some size to them. And, and, now, and some private equity people think they're actually operators. <laughs> they think they can go into a business and buy it because they, they can raise the money, they can invest the money, they can put that on the business. And then they think they can actually run the business. And their whole world is MBA, financial management, financial engineering, not operations. So that's where the opportunity is. If you're competing against that world of private equity, and yet you've, you've been on a path to compiling your 10,000 hours on your craft. The private equity guys have not. Mm -hmm. Their 10,000 hours is how do I roll up companies? How do I do financial engineering? Maneuvering money. I, look, I'd love for a private equity company to compete against me. I'd love for it. That, uh, private, let, me, let, me, let me parse that. A private equity company that thinks they're an operator. Mm -hmm. I haven't met one yet that thinks they can actually be actively engaged in a business day to day and be successful at it. There's probably a bunch of them out there. I just haven't met them. I met a lot of private equity guys that can buy companies and destroy a company. A ton of them. You can just Google that. From you just, The world is littered with a graveyard of private equity companies that buy companies, think they can operate it, be active in it, and then they run them into the freaking ground. There's... <laughs> now I say that. Let, let me balance that. I owe where I am today to a great little private equity group on my first acquisition. So, yeah, i got to love hate. They're my friend to me, the world of private equity. Right. But there's got to be this line of respect. And I think Ken, Ken Bull, in whatever our episode was when he came in, mm -hmm. he, he talked about a healthy respect between the founders, the investment group, and the operations group. And the two, they, there was a communication path, but there was a line of demarcation. He did a pretty good job laying that out, what that all looked like. Yeah. Uh, it's, and look, when you've got... It's, it's probably a template to success. Paver art can, can, I think paver art from the beginning to right now can mark, can mark its success very clearly with the beginnings of the company. Everybody that was involved in starting the business was involved in the nuts and bolts of the business, right down to the last dollar. We had our nose in the money every day. Everybody was cognizant of what was being spent, what was coming in, what was going out. Uh, they knew what kinds of sacrifices needed to be made, and those were seven-day weeks. And you know, and when we got to be a little bit successful, they became six-day weeks. Okay, mm -hmm. and then they became five or six-day weeks, 10, ten, ten to twelve-hour days. And you're just not getting around that. If you're going to get in, if you're going to, you want to start your own business. The, the, the the piece of advice I would give you, this is a little aside, the, the first piece of advice that I would give you is give up the rest of your life because that's what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. You're giving up a big chunk of the rest of your life. Work, work life balance, we, we talk about, we laugh every time we talk about work life balance. Mm -hmm. that, that is a joke, an absolute joke. 
Um, but that kind of that kind of ten thousand hours that came prior to starting this business armed everybody that did start this business to foresee, forego, and uh, uh, and expedite what needed to be done to make this business successful. And we worked really well together. That's that helps. That, that's that's really key. There wasn't one guy. Yeah, there was one guy for this and one guy for that. But when we came together and we had to discuss things and we had to make decisions as a group, you know, there was no animosity. If somebody's if somebody came up with an idea, that's great. We get to eat tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay, we get another paycheck. It's it's a um, uh, it's a it's a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous experience, and you look back at your career. I look back at mine. You got to have a spouse that is on board with this mentality. Yeah, we're basically. I mean, we're, we're tying all this together. We had a, we had a podcast. On right. That. I mean, I can imagine it, it. I can tell you, there's a lot of spouses. Like, all right, you work. Let's say you work sixty hours during a week, twelve hours a day, five days a week, and they say, "Honey, or dear." I'm going to go to the office. I got five hours. I got some catch up to do. And on I'm Saturday. Do, when, when you got young kids, right? Yeah. If that spouse is, well, wait a minute. You just spend 60 hours a week, which you can get that perspective, right? right. Exactly. So if the, the spouse is going to be on board with what your objectives are with the whole thing. If they resent you or they put rules on you or no, you got to go coach little Johnny's baseball game. And that practice starts at five. So you're making trade offs on all of this. So you got to decide. Where does family fit in? How does it coexist? How does it? Where are the lines that get crossed and not? Um, but those are, you know, life stage is definitely a part, a huge part of it. And is your spouse on board? If the spouse isn't on board, and you're going to feel that pressure for doing this, you can't do it. it ain't gonna, your marriage is going to crumble. So it got to be. It's got to be a partnership for the whole thing. You know, you're putting in ten to twelve during the day. I'm going to go get better at my craft, honey. Oh, see, you. see you later. See you dinner. Going to get better at my craft. Yeah, that's not exactly practical. If she's not on board, or he's not on board. Meanwhile, she's got one on her shoulder. She's right. got another one that's running around. <laughs> you're gonna do what? <laughs> How about my craft? Right. Well, you're absolutely right about that. We talked about that too. Yeah, the, the family context matters in the whole thing. It does matter. And I think the most important thing that matters is the person in the mirror. Do they want to excel to higher levels of compensation and responsibility or not? Um, if you do, there's going to be some. That question comes up. How much are you willing to put in for it? People don't just hand out money. No, and you don't. No, because you ask for it. That don't work that way. Yeah, and uh, some of it's retention. And on the other hand, for those folks out there who have never owned a business, never want to, and don't care, that's great. Good for you. Don't question and don't think. Oh, well, you own your own business. I, I love that. Well, you own your own business. Mm -hmm. So you know you can. You're probably more poor than the average if you own your own business. Not only are you more poor, but you have no time. Right. You have no time. Right. Well, you can you can you can work the hours that you want. You can come in late. Bullshit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Times two. Right. You know, cube that for God's sakes. That is not true. I mean, we're still doing it today at Paverar, and we've got uh, we got a workforce of nine now. Mm -hmm. You know, we you know we delegate authority as best we can, and uh, you know we kind of spread the responsibility around. But you know, you're still working a lot of hours. But like I said before, look, folks, you're going to get into something. You're going to start your own business. Understand that you are going to work your ass off. Mm -hmm. Just understand that and get used to it, and and embrace it, love it if you have to, because that's exactly what's going yeah, to happen. Yeah, yeah, and, and I wouldn't recommend anybody buy their own business or start their own business unless they simulated that deal. Maybe not ten thousand hours, but go work in a small business. Get your hands yeah. dirty before you've got the financial accountability of making payroll. Um, go go feel that world. Go taste that world a little bit before you actually go do it. Exactly. Now you you're going to be reckless if you don't. Now, technically speaking, the business that you got into is really the definition in our society of a small business. Okay. Pay and no, Allen Foods. Oh, that's yeah. It was sixty some odd employees. Um, it was a big small business, I would say. Well, but small business is typically defined as under hundred people. people will, right. Back in the day, that's what people understood to be a small business, right. as compared to the. You know, to uh, you know, to the Forbes 500 or right. something like that. Um, uh, business on the Forbes 500. There's, then you come to paper art. This is a, a micro business. Micro business. Yeah. That's exactly right. right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, 
and uh, it's 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 a the 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 work ethic involved is no different. Okay, will you wear the same number of hats? Probably. You know, there's a lot of responsibility. That's there's just so many things that go on every day. That you have to uh, that you've got to take care of. You got to be better to run a very small business than a medium size. Let, let's say the difference between a ten million dollar company and a sub one million is night and day, mm -hmm. right? Ten million dollars in revenue, and let's just say thirty five employees, gotcha. thirty five to fifty employees, mm -hmm. is night and day different than one million and three employees or four employees. I would, and I've done both. So I've and I've done the billion dollar publicly traded. Sure. And I've done the, the, the six million going up to three hundred thirty million growth company. Here's what I would tell you: my skill personally to, if I were to say Kraft Foods, biggest food company in America, or at least it was at the time, Sara Lee, publicly traded as well, Monogram Foods, six million to three hundred thirty million. Now they're over a billion. Uh, LM Foods, called fifteen to twenty million dollar business. Paver Art, when we bought it, sub one million. Mm -hmm. The skill that was needed to be successful at it. Maximum at paper art because he didn't have the resources. Right. There was no marketing guy. Exactly. They, there was a sales guy that happened to wear five other hats: the logistics hat, the finance hat, the payroll hat, the HR hat, the secondary plant manager hat. Yeah, that's what it was. So you got to be good at a lot of different things. So the skill set needed uh, is greatest for the smallest of all businesses because your resources are constrained. Your capital, everything's constrained. Capital, marketing, sales pipeline, you name it. And so thank God I have payroll right now versus when I was 30 years old. It's just and anybody who's listening to this that's thinking about starting their own business, I can tell you right now, it's great. It's a wonderful mm -hmm. feeling at the end of the week. Mm -hmm. When you know your week's done, at least, you know, I don't care when, you're, when your week ends, Saturday, Sunday, whatever. You know, yeah, you're always probably, it's always on your mind. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go away. But knowing that you can do that sort of thing, and you can handle the sacrifices that are required, uh, and you've been able to manage your personal life outside of this too, and make that work. Hopefully, make that work. It's a good feeling. It's a gift. Look, if yeah, you're it's when, a good it, feeling. when it works, and even when it doesn't work, and you're struggling, the opportunity as a small business owner, or even general manager, or, or senior leader in a business, sure. is to impact the lives of other people yeah. to grow them, and that's financially. If you're successful in the business and the results warrant it and you choose to invest some of that back into people, it's emotionally, it's skill set wise. I mean, not many jobs in the world you can say, all right, here's a team of three people. Here's a team of 30 people. And by golly, I can take them all within five years to a level that they're not going to get to if there was under some other owner, right? Yep. If you view it exactly. that way. And that, that's one hell of a, you're, you're impacting the lives and all the mouths that are fed by that one person multiplied by the number of people on your staff. I mean, that, that is one hell of a invigorating thing if you care about developing people. Well, and by the way, I would argue, if you don't care about people and developing them and getting them to a better spot in life, you probably shouldn't own a business. If all you're in it for is financial independence. That's important. We all want that. Yeah. But you better be more consumed with the people on your team. Yeah. And there's and there are those. That's right. And, and how do you model that? How do you you've got to model it yourself. You got to invest in yourself again. Back to getting better at your craft. You got to show that you've made that investment and you continue to make that investment. If you're an employee at a company, you better hope that somebody is investing in the business to make make it more secure, make it safer, make sure that they're building up their financial prowess, their capacity, all those things or else their job is at risk. I am. I have said this a million times. I am amazed at how many people are the walking dead out there in the American workforce. And now we've been through a period. Take COVID off the table. Mm -hmm. This this population for the past twenty years has not known sub five percent unemployment or north of five percent unemployment. Mm -hmm. This has been how long have we been underneath five percent? Quite a while. Yeah. Probably since two thousand and thirteen, after the Great Recession. Over a decade, we've been below 5%. Exactly. And we've been under 4% for, with the exception of COVID for a long time here, for five years, six years. Anyway, the point being, my point is, there's so many people that are vulnerable, that are working for an employer, they don't even know how much cash is in the bank and how many weeks of payroll they can cover if sales hit the skids. They are the walking dead. They don't even know it yet. Yeah. And that's, uh, because the owner's not communicating it. Not because they're bad people. And they're not asking the questions. And they're not getting better at their craft. I'm, I'm shocked at how many people are vulnerable. And, they're, and we know from the financial state of America, 
Most people can't absorb a whatever, a $600 expense, uh, a $1,000 expense, you know, the surprise your radiator just blew out or whatever it is. Your hot water heater just goes, how am I going to fund that? Well, they put it on a credit card. Well, and the, the cycle begins. The lesson learned there is that you got to expand your knowledge base. You've got to take that, invest that time. That's right. You owe it to your get family. Better at what either at what you do or find something else that you can get better at. And you know what's easy to measure is your own personal balance sheet. You've talked about this when you've mentored. If you don't want to get your skills better, okay, I get it. You don't want to spend the time, I get it. Is your personal balance sheet getting a little bit stronger each week? Yep. Exactly. Are you living within your means? Are you able to save 25 bucks a week, 50 bucks, whatever it is? Are you getting a year from now? Are you going to be better financially than you are now? So if you don't want to get better at your skills, at least get disciplined with your financials to get more strength in your family. By the way, that's an excellent point. When you said, you know, just take that, per, take that phrase, living within your means. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, also a cornerstone of owning your own business mm -hmm. and becoming an entrepreneur. That's right. You learn the hard way mm -hmm. that you have no choice but to live within your means. That's right. Okay. Uh, unless you're, unless somebody sprinkles magic dust over your business and, you know, all of a sudden money just comes from nowhere and they're printing it just for you. We all know that doesn't happen. So, yes, you've got to be able to, you've got to be able to manage that part of your life. When you own a business, you're forced to be that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the people that you owe money to will make sure that you're forced to be that That's way. That's right. So, uh, and uh, by the way, before I say anything else, pay your damn bills mm -hmm. and pay them on time. And this goes out to oh, if there's any contractors for paper <laughs> Thank you. that are listening to this to this podcast. What percentage of contractors are financially liquid, stable? What a great question. It that that number is probably higher than I would even want to venture a guess at. Our friend Paver Pete from TechoBlock, shout out to TechoBlock, our friends Ryan and uh, Paver Pete, he said the contractors are the number two most failed business in America. Mm. I've had three major home projects in my house. Two of them were an abject disaster. I'm chasing them for things. I double paid contractors, small sample, but it, it rests perfectly with what Paver Pete mm -hmm. was saying about that business. And these are, these are a contractor is one guy that's doing a little handyman work, right? Yeah. Or it could be a guy that's running a crew of 30 people Doing construction at a home, and they got three crews on the road. Yeah, no, well, that's your your. You want to separate yourself in the contracting world? Learn how to run a financial ship that doesn't leave your customers begging for you to come back and finish a job. These are these are basic tenets of running your own business. This, this is you have to be able to do that. Or all your dreams are going to go up in smoke in a very quick period of time. So let's dial back the ten thousand hour rule. Let's say people don't ever want to get into that. Fine. Just get better at financial management. Yeah. As a business owner, get two weeks of payroll in the bank instead of one day of payroll in the bank. And then next month, set a goal to get 2.1 days in the, in the bank. Or you set goals to get better financially. you got to put the time into that. If you don't want to get better at your craft, get better financially. And if you don't own a business, you're worth $1,000 today after credit card bills and your assets and your checking account. A month from now, let's see if you can get that up to 1100 And then get it up to 1200 And then a year from now... Maybe you can crack $3,000 and you'll start to feel some confidence. We know from the facts in America, people aren't doing that either. But that's, you'll feel better about your life if you can just get that area of your life nailed down a little bit. Yeah, and you'll, you'll have more that's options. That's exactly you'll have less right. stress. It's, you don't have to go to school to learn this. It's keep your, keep your hands and your money in your pocket. Well, we know they're not going to school to learn it because they're taking on $60,000 of debt when they're not even worth that. What bank would underwrite that kid? Nobody. So, again, of course, i got to go back to it. So we're, we're shuttle them into bad practices right away with college that they'll never get a return on. So exactly. exactly right. My bias comes out. I hate it when it does that. I can't, I can't help myself. Well, it's... it's the well, world, the times have changed. It's the opportunity to... This, is, this gives us the opportunity to talk a little bit about what we do because we never get a chance to talk about what we right. do. Okay. Um, so 10,000 hours, I think it's critical. I think people should give it some time, but if they don't do that, no problem. Go back to their personal balance sheet and see if you can get that strengthened over time. And I think good things will happen from that too. Step one, you're right. 10,000 hour rule, you know, expand your knowledge scope. Um, practice, you know, define what practice is. Get, make sure you've got the work ethic. When you have the work ethic, that that absolutely 100% of the time implies sacrifice. Let's, and that sacrifice that you're making is doing things for the benefit of yourself 
okay, and the future business that you may or may not own or buy or um, uh, or start because you you come up with a great idea. Look, but uh, I learned this in college. Marketing, we're all products, right? Mm-hmm. And good products are different from other products. They're defined and they're uh, they're unique, right? We think we're unique at pay reward, but people are products too. If you're in the field of marketing, here's how you get better in the field of marketing. Become the best damn financial person on a marketing team. Learn how to read a PL, a cash flow statement, and a balance sheet. I can assure you you're gonna be better that you're gonna be different than 99% of the other marketers if you can interface and go toe-to-toe with a CFO. Very simple thing. Most marketers won't do it. They're just not that good in that area. They think it's the CFO's job. No. Go head first into financial well, management. Yeah, that's right. Well, that well, they. I think a lot of people who get into marketing get into marketing because it's not accounting. If you're it's in, not, it's not finance, and it's not operations. Here's another one. All right, so that's marketing. I know that very well. If you're in production, learn how to pick up the phone and talk to customers, ask them questions, listen to them, and you will become a better production manager. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I use the example every time with Brian. Brian hates the word sales. But he might be the best damn sales guy we got. By the way, folks, Brian, Brian, McNulty. Is our, Brian McNulty is our plant manager. I, I, you know, so some of this is self-imposed limitations, but Brian is fucking awesome with customers. He is. I've never seen him have a bad customer call. No. I can rattle off 10 examples of me having a bad customer call, mm-hmm. and I, I grew up in sales and marketing. He don't have a bad customer call. Exactly. So there's an example right there. If you're in production, learn how to deal with customers and immerse yourself in that world. Make the salespeople your best friends. And you will go far in production. Well, we've got another example too. We, uh, we 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 pluck somebody out of production to help us in the sales department, and he's he's got he's got he's becoming um, stronger. And we, I, I was thinking about doing a podcast just on this by itself, but he's got he's got conversational skills, skills in when you're talking about marketing, which is a whole different topic here. But if you're talking about marketing, you have to have those conversational skills, which uh, disarm and inform. If you're in sales, here's how you get better at sales. Go spend a month in production. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's, it's the... If you can do six months, even better. But learn production and operations management. Learn what those guys go through every day, exactly. and you will become a better salesperson when you're dealing with your customers. You may be, it's amazing how many people stay in a silo their whole career. You may be... You, you may be... <laughs> you, you may be very bad <laughs> at the actual... You know the the conversational give and take. You know, sitting across the desk from a client, uh, or talking to them on the phone, or on a Zoom call. You may not be very good at that at all. But if your if you, if your technical background and knowledge of the product that your company and you're representing for your company, the customer is going to gravitate to you. They could care less that you could schmooze them over a bottle of Cabernet. What they care about is that you can solve their product problem, okay? And operations will help with that. Oh, my God. Operations is absolutely the bedrock. We want to mix metaphors or concepts here. You're a sales guy working for a small business that's financially constrained, but you want to get better at your craft. Go volunteer to your business owner to go work in operations for an hour a day, three days a week, four times a month. And, oh, by the way, boss, I'll do it for free. I'll do it for free, yeah. Oh, my God. Heresy. <laughs> what do you think that owner is going to think of you? Oh, you're giving away your time for free. Look, if you're if you're in that world of the exchange has to be one for one on everything, you've got to look at it. And an investment in yourself, whether you're getting paid or not, you're doing it for a reason because that's going to come back to you. It might not be demonstrable today, but if you're a better salesperson because you made that investment in yourself, the owner's going to love you, number one. Now, if they're capable financially of paying you, they should pay you. That should be part of the training and development. But if they can't, do it anyway. And if you're not willing to make that investment... In something, something that's going to directly, directly impact, impact your ability, ability to, deal to deal with, with your, your craft, craft, then just, just have, have limited expectations in your growth. growth. Well, again, again, that's probably going to make people's, people's stomach turn. turn. No, well, yeah, yeah. And that's, but, but I'm not, not talking, talking to them. We're talking to the no, other side. We're not talking to the percent. We're talking to the eight percent, or those who want to be part of the eight percent. And it's, um, uh, it's, it's maybe there's two people in the company. Maybe there's a sales guy and a production guy. Maybe they team up as buddies. Sales guy goes work with the production guy for five days a month and then the Yankee production guy out and go on a road with him, take him to the sales calls. They might get to know each other. They might find out they've got things in common. And the relationship building there is going to help both of them. Yeah, no question about it. Owners, I think in general, I can't, I can't character or generalize owners, but 
what I found is this cross-functional, and shout out to Wes Jackson, he gave me this mantra of developing people, pulling them out of their comfort zone, pulling people from the field, bringing them into the office. We used to call it the hot box. So he gets credit for this concept, but it works. It freaking works. It makes people uncomfortable, but it stretches them, and it makes them so much better than if they just stayed in that silo. Yeah, well, you've, you've done, done that here a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, we need to do more of it, and we need to do more of it, uh, but your timing and the way that you've approached that here at Payroll, this, I think has been very good, because that's what we needed, okay, we needed to get out of survival mode, and if you're going to get into, go from survival mode to growth mode, you've got to, you know, you got to get out of your comfort zone. Look, and when you're talking about your craft and 10,000 hours, that's what this is about, it's, you're comfortable right now. How do you define, define your profession, profession as a craft, get out of your comfort, comfort zone, zone, shake up the system, system break down that muscle so it becomes sore, sore so it repairs itself again? again. That's, That's where your career is. Now we're going to get into workouts. This is good. <laughs> this is probably going to be episode number 50. What a perfect one for episode 50, work ethic in 10,000 hours. It kind of wraps, it wraps up a lot. It's a nice little ball, a lot of the other podcasts that we've done on very specific parts of this. Well, well, okay, okay. We, we talked about, about 10,000, we, we talked, talked about the 10,000 hour rule uh, and working on expanding your knowledge scope in whatever field or uh, product development or business that you want to get involved with. <clears throat> Take the time on your own for not, not, maybe not get paid for it. And yes, you have to, you have to like and or love wanting to do that. Uh, that, that has to be in you. If you're not that person, person that's okay. okay. That's, that's perfectly fine. fine. But uh, if you're not that person, owning a business is probably, you're probably not cut out to do that. Mm -hmm. um, Finding that out before you actually own it is a good thing. It's a huge thing. Because you can go about, you can go about your life and, and do what you got to do and build on that. But Unwinding a business investment is not easy. So finding that out before you get in is pretty darn important. Oof. Yeah, because what, what you're going to realize is that once you get in, it's hard. you could be in over your head. Yep. But, but anyway, we, we, we did talk about that. Um, work and surround yourself. Work with and surround yourself with good people. And again, I'll say this. I've said this a hundred times and I'll say it a hundred more times. Surrounding yourself with people who are either smarter or know more than you. There's nothing wrong with that. Always pays off. It always pays off. And at the end of the day... Maybe, Maybe you become, become the smartest, smartest person in the room. But that, that doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, at the end of the day, what matters is the success of the business, the, you know, the successful selling and marketing of the product, uh, the, the successful development of the people that are working with and for you. Uh, these, it's just there's so many wonderful things that come as a result of being able to do this, as opposed to being just one part of it. You're part of all of it. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a terrific thing. Um, you, you have, have to, to like or love to work. There's, There's no, no this, this is, is not a bad thing, thing to like, you, you know, know, to like or love to work. work. You, you can see it in the people that are successful. They just, they, they can't wait. They bolt out of bed in the morning. Okay. They can't wait to come to work. Yes. There is, and I, we make fun of the work like balance phrase, but yes. Their idea of work-life balance is, in many cases, 90% work, 10%, you know, balance. That's all it uses the word balance. Maybe it's 80-20. Maybe, it, maybe it's 60-40. It's never 50-50. That can't happen. It's impossible. You can't be successful and do that. No. What, what else did you take from our conversation? Today? That's the three things I took. Look, at uh, a quick uh, little story. Uh, our, our first guest, guest he, uh, who we, we both know, know uh, Angelo. Angelo. Yep. I, I will get you. He, 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 terrific guy. Yeah, yeah. Really, and really successful. successful. Role model. I mean, he's, he's everything that you want in a business owner, owner, I think. I mean, uh, he shocked me with a, uh, we were talking about, in one of our commute home calls. He's always had this phrase of working above the business, uh, above the store at, or in the store. So are you working on the business or are you working in the business? He's always been the in the store, hands-on guy. And he's been very successful at it. It's worked for him. The other day I'm talking to him, he's saying, like, yeah, he's able to start to get the balance of, I, I forgot what the ratio was, I'll screw it up and he'll correct me, but it was like four days that he's working on the business. He's pulled himself kind of over that store. He's got a share group. He's got a marketing group. He's outsourcing some marketing. He's working on five or six different things that he doesn't have the inherent. He's learning the skill, and he's working with other restaurant owners to get better at this thing. And I'm like, he's my age. He's 49, 50 years old. 
and he's behaved a certain now remember on his podcast i think he what do you say he was 27 yeah when he started the business yeah exactly. and he had a great job in the engineer he you know the classic corporate world you know he was making more than most like 98 percent, and then he dives into the world of restaurant management one that's the number one paper beat number one most failed business so from 27 to let's just say 50 he's operated in the store not above the store and now we're talking and casual so yeah it's like i think it's more time above the store now than in the store so any at any time in your life this stuff can change if you make the conscious effort to change and start to take put things in place so it's possible to change at a later stage in your career and try and pivot to get to that next level of success so that's all in the theme of what we're talking about of growth discipline uh looking at your craft trying to get better i'll give you an aside a brief aside anyway so shout out to angelo on that shout out to angelo who's a Terrific guy, very successful restaurant. And he's the world's greatest ball breaker too. I mean, he's, you know, yeah, just he's well, got the Italian curse that I have. You, we all have some of our closest friends, if not our closest friends, right. are the biggest ball breakers in the world. Right. But the, um, uh, you know, going back briefly to the work-life balance, haha. The, uh, it's funny, you know, the people that we cherish the most, the people, our, our closest friends. Um, you know, outside of our families, because obviously we're, we're going home to our families. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're going home to our wife. We're going home to our kids, but we're not going home to our friends. Um, some of my closest relationships, I rarely get to see them. All right, same here. Okay, and I rarely get to see them for the same reason they rarely get to see me. Um, when they are when they're finished their jobs, they go home to families. So where are they spending their free time? They're spending their free time with their family. Mm-hmm. Okay. They're not going to a bar, okay? They're not, uh, you know, they're not going out to restaurants all the time. Uh, they're not, uh, you know, that it, it's they can't. They don't have the time. The little bit of time that they have, they spend with their families. Mm-hmm. So, you know, our good friends, we spend, you know, we thank God for technology. We spend time texting. We spend time uh, on the phone. Uh, you know, you and I, and I, I look at this as a, a fortunate thing. You and I both have... Uh, the fortunate circumstance of both having fairly decent commutes to Mm -hmm. and from work every day. And we spend that time, some of the time, maybe 15, 20% of the time, you and I are on the phone with each other. And those calls, you know, I'm pulling up into my driveway, we're still talking. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's usually an expansion of our work day. But uh, the other times I'm on the phone with my wife, with with Greg, with uh, Pat, with whoever I, you know, Whoever, I'm, whoever I wanted to talk to that day, because they're on their way home too, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's the only time you really get to connect with those folks. So that's a sacrifice to be made because you can't meet them. You can't go out with them as often as you like. But, again, they're doing the same thing that we are. You know, they're running businesses. They're, you know, running their lives. They're, you know, they've got that work ethic. Uh, it's a sacrifice that you make, but, hey, those people are part of your life too. Yeah, I, I look. I think the uh, when you start thinking Angelo's about Angelo is one of those guys. Yeah, when you start thinking about when, your, when was the last time you saw Angelo? Way too long ago. We're going to see each other at a, a little uh, weekend boys thing in a uh, whatever a month or two. But I can't answer the question, and that tells you it's too long. Wouldn't you rather spend? Wouldn't you rather spend? Be able to see him at least once a month. Oh, wow. absolutely. You, know, you and the wives get together for dinner over each other's it's houses tough. or something. You know, wouldn't you? But you can't. Right. You absolutely can't. There's no time. Right. He doesn't have the time. You don't have the time. And trying to make that work. Yeah, look, I think there's impossible. what is there 100 is what is the number 100 and there's x number of hours in a week. Yeah. So, you know, you got your work, you got your family, you got your friends, you got your play time. There's stuff there's trade-offs here and and you know, making those conscious choices by spending 4 hours more on this activity. That time didn't just expand. You got to give up four hours or something. So what is that going to be? So, but yeah, people are pretty, you know, the the one little exercise I remember doing, and I don't know, I was 26 or whatever, you start documenting half hour increments of your day, what you're spending your time on. It's amazing how much time gets pissed away during the day. And now it's even worse. Look, I look at my screen time with freaking TikTok. I mean, I'm a hard worker. I can find a way to piss away three hours very, very easily. Well, uh, I mean, it States, is, it's embarrassing. If the United States government, in, in, in its infinite wisdom, has its way, oh yeah, they'll be you, gone. You won't have to worry about right. TikTok anymore exactly. in a month. Uh, 
I'll just find a way to piss it away somewhere else. So <laughs> exactly even the most hardcore person can find a way to piss hours away. Oh my God! But you're right on. You know the uh, the friends, the family. The, this stuff all comes with trade offs that you yeah. got to give some thought to. Exactly, and it's look. It's what makes you a well rounded person. Your family, your friends. It's not just it's different. It's not just your job. It's uh, you know. Look, I I told a story. I don't know when it was. Uh, when our financial risk was highest, when I had all this debt on me, I had to block out a big segment of my life, which was family. Why? Because they were being corrosive to me, being successful in business. Right. That sounds pretty fucking brutal, doesn't it? Yeah. That's yes. Harsh it would be the term. A hundred people would say that's fucking brutal. Well, guess what? There were sixty-five people that were relying on me to be the best version of myself I could be, and that was putting me at risk. It was putting that whole thing at risk. Sure. Now, we could also say, look, I have accountability with that. I'm the ultimate mirror guy. I didn't find a way to manage it effectively and deal with that in the context of it all. So what did I do? I brought them into the plant, tried to get them to see my environment. It didn't fucking work. So I had to put everything at bay a little bit, or I would have screwed that thing up 10 times over. Yeah, that's, I, and guess what? That was the right yeah, choice. Yeah. So did I like it? No. No. Was it the right choice? If I wasn't willing to do that, then I shouldn't have been the owner of the business. Correct. That's yeah. what comes first. You've got a responsibility, and people's livelihoods are at stake when you're owning a business. And if that means that those choices have to be made, I believe they've got to be made. If you're not willing to make them, don't go into ownership. Yeah. That's, that's, it's a sacrifice that you make. That sounds pretty brutal, but that's the truth. And oh, by the way... <laughs> I tell this. I love this story. I love this story. By the way, when I say family, that's outside my nuclear hope, Kim and Dominic. That's know, everybody okay. else. Absolutely. The um, <laughs> the next level of family. the outlaws. The uh, the out the uh, as opposed to outliers, outlaws. Right. Exactly. The um, um, I, I tell this story. We, we just got finished talking about some of the sacrifices that you make, and some of those you're not sacrificing your friendships because you're you're really good friends. Understand that they're going through They'll the same support thing it. you are, and they will support it, and we support them. But uh, uh, or you can take the tack that my brother did, hire them. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's going to be working for Ken Bull soon. <laughs> That's exactly right. And something I tell this story every time I get around. Uh. I get around the At some point in your life, you will work for my brother. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And that's how he keeps his family and friends intact. He just puts them on the payroll. He puts them on the payroll. That's exactly right. Now, see, he could do that. He could do that at five below. <laughs> but uh, and anyway, well, I think this was a uh, good job. A great subject. I'm, I'm I'm glad we're back in the groove again, uh, and hopefully, uh, uh, more and more good ideas will come out of this. So I think uh, uh, I think what we basically did was wrap up, not wrap up, but tie together a lot of the past podcasts that we talked about and kind of hopefully put it together in a, uh, in a cohesive way so that somebody who might be thinking about starting their own business or getting into the whole entrepreneurship field, if you will, um, uh, it might be helpful for them. Yep. So, Good job. Folks, thank you very much.